Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is April Wepler, and I am the Engagement Coordinator at the Canadian Environmental Law Association, or CELA. I want to thank everyone for joining us for the webinar. This is the first in a series of three webinars where we're looking at air quality issues in Amjanong First Nation. And this first session today will share information about the health impacts of emissions from the surrounding industry. And we'll provide an overview of the regulatory framework that governs air quality in Ontario, including the permitting system for air emissions. And before we get started, I'll just share my own land acknowledgement. So I'm in Guelph. I live on the banks of the Speed River. And we're on the traditional lands of Anishinaabek and Haudenosaunee peoples, as well as treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and Six Nations of the Grand Watershed. And I will start by telling you just a little bit about the Canadian Environmental Law Association. CELA is a public interest law clinic dedicated to environmental equity, justice, and health. We were founded in 1970, so CELA is one of the oldest advocates for environmental protection in the country. With funding from Legal Aid Ontario, CELA provides free legal services relating to environmental justice in Ontario, including representing qualifying low-income and vulnerable or disadvantaged communities in litigation. And we also work on environmental legal education and law reform initiatives. And then I'll just also mention that the Canadian Environmental Law Foundation is the charitable arm of CELA, and the foundation influence in, in, influences and uses environmental law and policy to safeguard equity, justice, and health. Uh, the foundation's key initiatives include the Canadian Environmental Law Archives, an annual fellowship for one aspiring environmental lawyer, and the Access to Justice for Northern Communities initiative. The foundation has been around since 1993 and has been raising funds to support CELA's projects, as well as archiving documents that chronicle the history of Canadian environmental law. All right, and I am joined on the line today by my colleagues from CELA, Teresa McClenahan, who is our executive director, and Jackie Wilson, who is a lawyer with CELA. Also on the line is Zoe St. Pierre, who is the articling student at CELA. And we were invited to, um, to plan these webinars and deliver these webinars in the communities um, with a planning team from Anjanong. So we have Matt Stone, who is a hybrid staff lawyer with Indigenous Legal Services and Legal Aid Ontario, Amber Chapdelaine, who is the articling student for Legal Aid Ontario, and Jeff Plain, who is a community legal worker and Aboriginal justice coordinator with the Community Legal Assistance Sarnia Clinic. And so this is our agenda for today. Um, a quick bit of housekeeping before we get going. So we're hosting this today on Zoom webinar. You'll notice that your mics and your cameras are turned off. Um, and we have also turned off the chat feature just to help keep comments and questions organized. So we would ask that you pose any questions that you have in the Q&A feature. Um, so I know everyone's super familiar with Zoom these days, but there is a little icon in your um, icon bar um, for the Q&A, you can click on that and, and ans ask any questions that you have in the Q&A um, feature, and we will take questions after the presentations. So we're going to hear from both Teresa and Jackie today, as I said, talking about the health impacts of emissions, the cumulative impacts, as well as an overview of the Ontario Legislative Framework for Air Quality. So before I pass the mic over, I'll just give you a little bit more context. Um, this is the first in a three-part series. We are recording the session today, and we will, as soon as possible, make it available um, for viewing afterwards. It'll be posted on our website and circulated to everyone who registered. There are three webinars in the series. They happen on Tuesdays at 1230. So the next one is May 2nd. The third is May 9th. The second one will talk about um, what information about air emissions is available to the public and how you can access it. And the third, we'll talk about what tools are available to report environmental concerns and why reporting is important. And you'll notice as we get into today's presentation that these topics are very intertwined. Um, we wanted to break them up into three sort of digestible, shorter webinars um, out of respect for everyone's time. And then these three sessions will be followed up by an in-person session in the community in late May. So we'll present some of this information again with more you know, nuance and information as we'll have more time. Um, as well as hosting a summary advice clinic, so a pop-up legal clinic um, where you can pose questions to Teresa or whatever other uh, counsel we have on site. And then the last thing I'll say before I pass the mic over is just some context about CELA and how we can help. Um, we really want to come into the community and be helpful and help to affect some change. Um, we're probably not going to be the solution for litigation or taking anyone to court, but we can push for regulation, enforcement of standards, um, consideration of cumulative impacts, those sorts of things. And I think Teresa will speak a bit more to that. 
So with that, I will pass the microphone over to Teresa. Great, thank you, April. Um, so yes, as April said, uh, there are going to be three webinars and then in person. So they are going to be um, fairly high high level today. And then next time, next week, we'll start to delve a bit more into what to what to make of uh, of some of the information from today. So starting um, with uh, a basic regulatory context, um, we have the Canadian Environmental Protection Act in Canada. It's actually undergoing some revision now in the federal parliament, but the current version has uh, been in force since 1993. And there's the section that talks about when substances are toxic because they may constitute a danger to human life or health in Canada. Benzene has been declared to be toxic under SEPA. Uh, toluene, which I also have some slides about, um, is not considered SEPA toxic, but does have some important human health implications in, in large uh, quantities. Next slide. Or can I advance them, April, as a presenter? Okay. No, you can. I'll advance for you. Okay. Um, so starting with benzene, and these are not all of the substances being reported by the facilities in the Sarnia area or being emitted, um, but just a couple of examples that, that we chose today. We'll delve into some others in future webinars. Um, but benzene, which is um, uh, a concern because it's a group one carcinogen, and the exposure of concern can be multifold. It can come through um, breathing it, through contact with skin, uh, particularly over time or ingestion um, through uh, consuming food or water. And uh, it can also cause um, uh, depression of the uh, immunity systems at uh, levels of 10 parts per million and above uh, on an ongoing basis or neurological effects and behavioral disturbances at 100 parts per million and above. And in terms of the carcinogens of concern, uh, the one that is repeatedly mentioned in the literature is leukemia and particularly through occupational exposure pathways. There's also um, recognition that benzene is uh, doesn't have a threshold for toxicity, meaning that there's not uh, a safe level where you would expect no effects. Um, rather, adverse health effects may occur at any exposure level. Next slide. And then looking at another substance um, that's reported to the National Pollutant Release Inventory, which we'll see in a moment, is uh, from, from the... Uh, petroleum refineries is toluene. And in terms of health effects from toluene, it's considered a group 2B carcinogen, meaning it's possibly carcinogenic, uh, meaning not nearly as certain as benzene. It also has other types of health endpoints like respiratory irrita irritation and association with occupational asthma and chronic bronchitis. And there's an Ontario ambient air quality criteria for toluene at uh, 2,000 micrograms per cubic meter in 24 hours, and that's based on odor. And then there are some other toluene um, substances, uh, disocyanates cyanates that have a 0.2 per gram per cubic meter ceiling based on health. It's not considered SEPA toxic, meaning it hasn't been um, declared toxic under that section of the federal legislation. The US Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry uh, does warn of significant effects at high levels. Um, very high levels can be very extreme health effects from neurological to uh, even, even death. Next slide. So we conducted some searches of the National Pollutant Release Inventory um, to see what the, the total uh, reported emissions of some of the substances that the refineries are reporting on um, amount to. The National Pollutant Release Inventory 
is a registry that's maintained by Environment Canada. Similar registries are also maintained in the United States and Mexico. It's set up under SEPA, the federal law, and it's public. So facilities are required to report to the NPRI, as I'll call it, uh, if they meet certain thresholds. So if they have a certain number of employees or if they have certain substances that are being emitted over a certain quantity. Um, so these are relatively large facilities across Canada who are required to report annually to the NPRI. So the Imperial Oil Sarnia refinery plant uh, is required to report. Its ID number is 3704 if you do a search. And in one of the future webinars or in person, we'll run a little toolkit on how to search the registry for facilities or ge geographically in your area. And um, just the way that I grabbed the screenshot, the the uh, label for benzene fell off the, the list, but the top brownish color, if your slide shows the same colors as mine, is, uh, is benzene. Uh, and then um, there are a number of other uh, compounds shown for um, totals, for example, in, uh, in 2021 of uh, something approximately 13 um, tons. Of, uh, of emissions. Next slide. And uh, looking specifically at uh, how those emissions are happening, if you search that same uh, plant under the NPRI, you'll see that uh, a very large proportion are uh, of those particular emissions are releases to air and uh, of benzene and benzene-related compounds. So in other words, these are not being um, for the most part, taken uh, to landfill or or sent for recycling or or released through water. They're being released if they're released at all, which they are, um, in a number of mechanisms to air. Next slide. And then another refinery in the area that reports to the NPRI is the uh, Suncor Energy Products Partnership. Sarnia Refinery, and that ID number is 3071, if you'd like to do a search there. And um, apart from 2016, when there was a significant uh, off-site transfer for treatment, um, uh, as of uh, 2021, uh, again, most of the releases for the benzene and related compounds were to air. Next slide. And looking at that same facility, um, the uh, total tonnage um, released, uh, again, um, there was a big uh, uptick in 2016, but in 2021, the uh, total tonnage was um, something approximately, uh, um, looking at the scale here, probably around five, uh, four or five tons. Next slide. And then if we add toluene to that search, uh, which is the, the darker purple, uh, we do see um, significant emissions being reported uh, for toluene as well from the Suncor refinery. And next slide. So um, the question is what uh, health-based standards exist around these standards, uh, around these substances? And one place to look at that question is to ask what the uh, Ontario ambient air quality criteria are. These are criteria that have been set by the province um, based on uh, uh, studies done nationally and then, and then adopted in each province um, in terms of proposing uh, the criteria that uh, we should strive for ensuring that the substances remain below these levels for a health perspective. And so for uh, uh, benzene, Ontario established general ambient air quality criteria of 0.45 micrograms per meter uh, cubed on an annual basis or 2.3 micrograms per meter cubed over a 24 hour basis. And both of these were established in order to provide protection against chronic effects. Next slide. So there is a system of uh, monitors across the country and 
that's publicly available. We'll delve more into that in a future webinar about how you can um, get at that and and uh, pay attention and and um, see what the uh, surveillance network is showing over time. But they show um, in uh, 2019 uh, benzene levels in Sarnia at the monitor, which is located at 700 Christina Street in Sarnia. Uh, we took a look and it's at the Service Ontario office. Uh, so that is showing maximum of 2.047 micrograms per meter cubed, uh, minimum of 0.100 micrograms per meter cubed, and um, there's a wrong unit there, <laughs> and uh, a mean of 0.419 uh, across 57 samples taken at that uh, surveillance station in 2019. Um, CARAX also has some mapping to help um, visualize the results across the country or in a particular region of the country. And then uh, I also uh, showed the ethylbenzene results at that station. Next slide. And then for toluene, um, the results at that same station, uh, had a mean of 0 0.0.779 um, micrograms per cubic meter. So there was a 10-year trend um, showing a reduction of 39% uh, for toluene um, from 2010 to 2019. And next slide. Mm. Can you go two back, please, April? Uh, Sorry. I was typing in another window, Teresa, and I messed up your slide order. Where were we? Oh, I got to go backwards, not forwards. Uh, yeah, I think we're going to have to go quite a bit back. Just back out, go to the right one, and then we'll pick it back <laughs> up. Sorry about that. That's all right. What slide were we on? Tell you in results at Sarnia. Uh, yeah, but I think we skipped something. Okay. So you can Let go me just before that. This. Sorry, folks. All right. Uh, yeah, go back one before that, please. Uh, and one before that as well. <laughs> okay. All right. So we covered that one. Then go to the next slide. Uh, yeah. And, and we'll talk a little bit later in the slide, as you saw in the slides, um, about trends. Uh, but these were the, the benzene results, which we did take a look at. And as you can, uh, see, they are above, um, the the mean as well as of course the maximum is above the um uh criteria value next slide april thanks and then um you'll see a trend uh, slide in a bit where both of them are are showing uh trends at the sarnia monitor but i'll give you a preview on that um, while we're on this one when you look at the sources, they turn out to be primarily from transportation and not from the un industrial facilities. So important, but but uh, not coming from those facilities. Next slide. Uh, and just to give a picture of where that uh, monitor is in the community. So this is ambient air in the community and it's um, th these kinds of monitors uh, exist all over the country. Uh, and then the Imperial Oil Facility is uh, five uh, and a half kilometers away or so to the south. Next slide. And of course, there are other facilities in the area. Um, so thinking about trends, the, the national um, surveillance system, as I mentioned, show the 10 year trend uh, for benzene as well as decreasing by 42% over the, the 10 year period in question. Um, but again, the mean for benzene is uh, is still well above the Ontario air quality criteria value. Um, and uh, uh, if we go to the next slide, the um, uh, similarly, the toluene trends decreased, as I mentioned. Uh, and I already um, gave you the uh, heads up that the decrease is from uh, decrease in emissions of benzene and toluene from road vehicles and transportation. Otherwise, the fugitive sources and the point sources from industry have been relatively flatlined over the 10 years. 
Next slide. So I think it's over to Jacqueline. Thanks very much. I'm going to take a quick look at Ontario Regulation 41905, which sets out three approaches to regulating air pollution. The first is provincial standards that are set. The second is site-specific standards. And the third approach is what are called technical standards. The provincial standards are based on point of impingement calculations, which um, look at um, a point where a contaminant contacts the ground or a building. And the way that those are calculated is through air dispersion models. The level of the contaminant at that point of impingement is then compared to a provincial standard. So for instance, the standard that I'm discussing um, at this point isn't exactly what is coming out of the stack. It's what is coming out um, and then calculated through these models. Um, at a ground or building site. Schedule three lists some of the same substances with other averaging periods. And so again, I've listed a few, although there's larger tables that you can look through depending on the substance of interest. Um, so for example, benzene is 0 0.45 micrograms per cubic meter on an annual basis um, as a different um, standard as well. Under this regulation, um, the second way to comply is through what are called site-specific standards, and an individual facility can request a less stringent air pollution standard through an application, which po is posted on the Environmental Registry of Ontario. Um, none have been identified that we could find in um, Omjanong or the Sarnia area. So I'm not going to spend too much time discussing what's in those applications for these purposes. The third way to comply with the regulation is to comply with a technical standard. They are industry specific um, and they look at specific equipment too. There's an application required first to create the standard. All that's required is two facilities of the same type. Um, and then there are requirements in the regulation about showing for instance that it isn't technically feasible to comply with the provincial standard. And once the standards is set, then other facilities of that type can register um, through an application process to have that standard apply to them. So at the bottom of the slide is a link to the registry which lists the facilities in Ontario using these technical standards. This slide outlines um, only some of the requirements to register for a technical standard that's been established. You'll note that the test does not necessarily require demonstration that discharges will not cause an adverse effect because an applicant can instead show that the adverse effect will be better prevented, eliminated, or ameliorated by a technical standard. There's also a requirement to show there is no public interest reason sufficient to refuse approval. We did a search for uh, technical standards in the Sarnia area, and it came up with six facilities near Amjanong, three petroleum refining facilities, and three petrochemical facilities. And there's technical standards for several contaminants, um, including benzene and benzoapyrene. To provide uh, one a slightly more specific example, we went back and looked at the initial posting for the petroleum refining industry standard. This link on this slide is to an archived environmental registry post. We've reproduced um, in the next slide some of the justification for the standard. The ministry in its description looks at targeting resources and efforts to the most significant sources of benzene and benzoapyrene and a combination of approaches. So for instance, the ministry has looked at um, focusing on sources that include at least 2% by weight of benzene, um, ongoing monitoring and auditing, collaboration with affected communities, and a planned review of performance of the standard. And on the next slide, there's also a description in that initial posting of the technical standard about um, some of the justifications. So self-assuring compliance, uh, triggers for ministry oversight and follow-up actions where necessary and accountability. 
Turning to the current technical standard then for petroleum refineries, the crux of it is that it creates um, equipment type standards which need to be met, or if other equipment is used, you must show it as at least as effective as controlling, um, at controlling benzene pollution. So for example, in part two of the standard, looking at performance, there's a requirement to create um, a so-called closed system to capture benzene emissions through certain pollution control devices. And then there's exceptions to that requirement. Part six, uh, section six of part two, looks at the different air pollution devices that can be used. Um, and then for instance, the air pollution device must reduce the discharge of benzene to the air by at least 95% on a mass basis. Um, the different requirements look at storage vessels. Um, they look at uh, air emissions from industrial sewage, uh, product loading, um, and leak and detection repair. And again, there's requirements then for the types of equipment that may be used and certain standards for the equipment to meet. Um, for the purposes of this uh, webinar today, I wanted to draw your attention to part nine of the standard, which looks at ambient monitoring. Section 60 requires ambient air monitoring. There's 12 ambient air monitors if the property of the facility is eight hectares or larger, or six ambient air monitors if the property is under 80 hectares in size. Each monitor samples over a two week period. And in the opinion of the director, it must adequately, first of all, measure the concentration of benzene in the air and be located in a manner that reflects benzene discharges from the facility. One of the factors to consider in locating uh, the monitors is if a healthcare facility, a senior citizens or long-term care facility, a childcare facility, an educational facility, or a dwelling is close by. And another factor in terms of determining location is whether a First Nation is interested in the location of the monitors. Um, and those monitors measure in micrograms per cubic meter. Section 61 of the standard looks at creating a baseline for the facilities, which is created over three years. And then it's a rolling baseline. So it's updated with each new year of data. And then section 62 looks at uh, statistically significant increases over the baseline for a given facility. The idea being um, that these facilities should maintain their current levels of emissions and can't um, have increases that are statistically significant. If there are statistically significant increases, there's a requirement for notification of the Ministry of Environment, the Provincial Ministry, um, and then some requirements to um, give ideas on how to make sure um, those st statistically significant increases won't occur again. There's also in part 10 of the standard a complaints records and reporting procedure, which we'll uh, spend a bit more time on in a later webinar, um, but it does include annual summary reports. As a whole, this is not the same type of standard for a contaminant that you see in the way that pro the provincial standards are created. It does focus on um, equipment, maintaining uh, certain standards of equipment and, and measurement, and not increasing emissions over your own baseline. I'm going to turn it back to Teresa. Teresa, you're muted still. Thank you. So if we look at the facility specific reports that are required um, under the uh, technical standard that Jacqueline just described, uh, Imperial Oil is an example of a facility um, providing reports. And so looking at the 2019 report, we see a range of individual results and we'll pull those up in a moment. Um, uh, individual results for benzene and each of those uh, sample points are representing a two-week interval. Many of the samples are above uh, the Ontario ambient air quality value for benzene and I'm, I'm saying that in recognition that there is a technical standard but if we want a number to compare them against um, the ambient air quality number uh, in the community is, is uh, not something you would find at these monitoring stations on site. 
Um, and uh, many of them also have not only two week samples, but annualized values uh, above um, that ambient air quality number. Uh, and I'm indicating a, a few if you look in the detail when you get the slides at the uh, rows and columns mentioned. And we also have a map showing a portion of the uh, of the site and the legend showing the surrounding institutions. So if we can go to the next slide. So this is a map from Imperial's report showing in the, in the green dots the location of those monitors that are reporting that you'll see on the next slide. And then uh, the green squares are schools. Uh, the blue square is childcare. The um, yellow square is senior citizens residents. And the uh, violet square is long-term care home. And as Jacqueline noted, these are among the facilities of concern. Um, in the technical standard and uh, the kinds of um, institutions that that would be uh, of particular uh, concern to pay attention to in terms of emissions. Next slide. So obviously this is too tiny to read right now, and we'll be in a future webinar um, talking about how to find public reporting and uh, um, and um, and looking at the results, but this is just a screen grab from that same 2019 report for the substance benzene, and um, they show the stations that match uh, the points on that map um, across the top, and then the um, the two week each each sample point is a two week interval, and then the annualized across the bottom. Next slide. So back to Jacqueline. Thank you. Um, we did want to mention that there is a cumulative cumulative effects assessment policy that applies in the Sarnia area. However, it's quite limited in that it only looks at benzene for this area and um, no industry action was required um, at this point. The last thing I wanted to highlight were some reported exceedances of air standards. Um, this is a report that is available on Ontario's Open Data website. Um, in the 2021 annual report, um, there were three reported exceedances in this area. Um, and so I've just listed them on the slides. The first is Imperial Oil Sarnia, which exceeded the sulfur dioxide levels on April 7th to 8th, 2021. And um, in that data report, you can see that a penalty was issued for that exceedance. The only other um, two reported exceedances for this year or 2021 were two Nova Chemicals facilities which exceeded the ethylene standard. No penalties were issued for those exceedances. It looks like the exceedance date um, at the 785 Petrolia Line facility was the same date that the Imperial Oil facility reported an exceedance. We're not sure why that date is the same. Um, we'll look into it further. Um, and in this case, uh, no penalties were issued. Okay, that's the end of my presentation. Okay, and we have our contact information. And then as indicated, this is the first of three webinars and then an in-person um, presentation in the community as well as a, a pop-up clinic. Uh, so in the future webinars, we'll be delving further into uh, public reporting, access to information, um, right to know some of the, the how to make heads and tails of the information that is being discovered, and as well as we go further, what are some um, opportunities that uh, might be arising about the way these substances are, are being regulated and other opportunities to try to influence um, the way uh, these substances are regulated and overseen in this area. So I'll turn it back to you, April, to let us know if there are any questions. Thanks, Teresa. And thank you both for those presentations. So what I'm actually gonna do is ask anyone on the line who has a question or is interested in hearing the, convert, the discussion, the Q&A to stay on the line, um, but I am going to pause the recording in just a moment. Um, so I'm going to do an artificial wrap up for the sake of the recording, and then we'll stay on for the Q&A. Um, so thank you both for the presentations, and this recording will be available um, online very soon. <laughs>